In this video, we'll explain why sit-ups cause lower back pain and why it is a terrible exercise to practice when trying to establish functional movement patterns. We will also look at the reasons given by the US Navy for removing sit-ups from their training and performance tests this year, as well as how the biomechanics experts suggest we should build our core muscles to prevent back pain and increase athletic performance. For those new to the channel, my name is Christopher. I'm a sports and exercise scientist and the founder of Exercising Health. So now that we are acquainted, Let's get going. In my profession, we are always looking to maximize people's athletic performance while minimizing the risk of injury. Obviously, an injured athlete can't perform well, so correct exercise selection is key in my field. With this in mind, let's see how the sit-up holds up to our stringent requirements. During the sit-up and crunch, the abdominal muscles shorten, forcing the spine into flexion. Let's freeze frame this position and see how it translates into functional movements. Well, it makes for a terrible looking squat with a noticeable butt wink. Performing the deadlift with this rounded back puts you at higher risk for injury. Trying to do push-ups in this position is comical <laughs> and obviously lifting anything overhead or inverting into a handstand is impossible with the spinal shape. A better alternative to the sit-up and crunch is the plank and side plank which maintains a static neutral spine at all times. Let's freeze frame again. This posture lends itself well to athletic movements, such as the squat, deadlift, push-up, overhead press, and handstand, as well as our everyday standing and sitting postures. Okay, that makes sense, right? I mean, it would look pretty ridiculous doing any type of full body motion with a rounded posture as practiced in the sit-up. So from a functional movement perspective, the sit-up is a counterproductive exercise. Unless, of course, you want to practice being 100 years old with a hunchback. Just in case you're still not convinced, let's investigate other issues surrounding the sit-up. Then we will back the information with scientific research. A stable spine relies on all of its surrounding musculature to work in unity with each other. We could compare it to a tent which is kept upright by a series of guy wires attached to it from all directions. When the wind blows from one direction, the tent's cables on that side will tense up to maintain stability. If the wind changes direction, the other wires will tense up to keep the tent from collapsing. The human spine is tested in the same way while running over uneven ground, changing direction, balancing a load overhead or any other dynamic movement. The sit-ups focus on a single movement pattern excludes many of the muscles meant to assist in stability. Much like removing all but one of a tense guy wires, in this way it fails to prepare us for our ever-changing environment and activities. And because practice makes permanent, continuing to perform this isolated abdominal exercise could lead to structural asymmetries and poor motor patterns in all other movements. So there are a few things to talk about here. As mentioned in the animation, the sit-up excludes many of the core muscles from working to stabilize the spine. In fact, when the spine rounds over or flexes in the sit-up, the back muscles switch off. This phenomenon is known in the literature as the flexion relaxation phenomenon. Over and above compromising spine stability like a tent with missing guy wires, when the back muscles deactivate during full flexion, the only structures left to support the spine are the ligaments that attach one vertebra to another. While continuously tugging on those connective tissues in repeated sit-ups will cause them to stretch. If one has stretched ligaments, the entire spinal structure becomes lax and its integrity is thus compromised. This means that each vertebra is then allowed wiggle room to move and shear across each other during walking, running, or any other exercise for that matter. And these shear or sliding micro movements can cause degeneration, inflammation, and subsequent pain in the back over time. So we never want to pull our spine so far from its natural position to the point where we start pulling on the foundational structures such as ligaments. The issues with this traditional abdominal exercise don't end there. When we do a sit-up, the front side of the bony vertebra completely pressed together while the back portions move apart, tugging at those ligaments as described earlier. The front portion of the bones have been recorded to incur an average of 3,000 newtons of compressive forces when they are squeezed together. That's equivalent to 306 kilograms of acute force on the front portion of the spine on every sit-up. Now the National Institute of Occupational Safety sets an action limit for lower back compression of 3,433 newtons for all workers who do heavy lifting as part of their job. So each sit-up is approaching that near max compression force set by the Institute. This begs the question, why would we ever want to put that amount of stress on our spine by doing sit-ups? 
especially when it is clearly a poor exercise for developing functional movement capacity. And it's not just me who is saying these things. The US Navy recently stated in the Navy Times that by July 2020, they will no longer use the sit-ups as an exercise to track the fitness of their SEALs. The Chief of Naval Operations, John Richardson, stated that, we're going to eliminate the sit-ups because those things have been shown to do more harm than good and are not really a good test of our core strength. This is a big deal because the Navy has been using the sit-up as a staple exercise for many years. They obviously have enough data now to suggest that the old school abs exercise has no functional utility for their soldiers and is actually counterproductive to the health and performance of these specialized troops. So the only question left to ask is, how should we be training our core? Well, the first step to determining this is to figure out the primary role that the lower spine and its surrounding musculature play in the context of movement. In a literature review titled Optimizing Performance by Improving Core Stability and Core Strength, the authors described core stability as the ability to control the position and the motion of the trunk over the pelvis to allow optimum production, transfer, and control of force and motion to the terminal segments in integrated athletic activities. That's a mouthful, but it basically means that if we had to think of the pelvis and the rib cage as two tabletops, they should remain parallel to each other. Maintaining this position will ensure that the force generated through the legs, arms, and shoulders can be efficiently transmitted through the stable and aligned spine. If, however, the alignment of these tabletops are lost, the lower back will lose stability and the force generated from the limbs will leak out through the bend in the spine, which will hurt performance and increase the risk of a back injury. This same literature review described core strength as the muscular control required around the lumbar spine to maintain functional stability. This basically describes the muscle's ability to stabilize the spine when it's challenged. Okay, so if core stability is what we're after, and if sufficient muscular coordination and strength is needed to facilitate the stability, then let's see what's the best way to train these muscles so that we can select the right method. Our muscles contract in three ways. We'll use the arms and biceps to demonstrate this. So if I'm holding a weight in my hand and start lowering it slowly, my biceps are contracting to control the speed of the descent but the muscle is lengthening at the same time. This is called an eccentric contraction. If I then curl the weights up, the biceps contract again, but this time they shorten to do so. This action of the muscle is called a concentric contraction. Finally, if I lower the weight halfway down and hold that position, the muscle stops changing its length in order to stabilize the arm and keep the weight fixed in that one place. This muscular action of resisting motion is called an isometric contraction. Based on what we have learned about the lumbar spine and how stability in this area is paramount for developing functional movement patterns, it makes sense then to train the surrounding core musculature isometrically so that they can learn to resist motion and fight to keep the spine in a safe, neutral shape. But just to further prove that isometric training is the best way to exercise the muscles surrounding the spine, let's go back to the sit-up and analyze its motion more closely. In a study done on the mechanics of torso flexion in the sit-up, the author found that once the upper body reached maximum flexion during the initial crunch, the rest of the sit-up was initiated through the hips. Furthermore, each consecutive rep thereafter was performed with the abs isometrically contracted, causing the spine to be fixed in that initial position and all the movements occurred about the hips. These findings prove to us that the body intuitively selects to lock the spine in an isometric hold and move through the hips at every possible opportunity. Therefore, we should consciously try and assist the body to express itself in its preferred pattern of spine stability and hip mobility. So in the case of the sit-up, if we know that the spine is under a great deal of stress in the maximally flexed position, and the body wants to move through the hips anyway, wouldn't it be better to find exercises that lock the spine in a more neutral and safer position and then move through the hips? In this way, we can get all the intended benefits of the sit-up without the risk of developing back pain. Okay, so now that we know that isometric exercises are the best way to challenge the core muscles surrounding the spine, the last thing we must decide on is intensity. So let's investigate. Every movement is essentially a core movement, whereby energy is constantly being created by the legs, arms and hips, and transferred through the spine into the environment and the objects we are interacting with. So with this in mind, we must create core stiffness in everything we do, from walking, to sitting on and getting off a chair, and lifting heavy objects, 
This effort will ensure that we guard the neutral curve of the spine while allowing for efficient energy transfer between limbs. And because we are supposed to be using the core muscles all day, it is obvious that these muscles should be trained for endurance rather than strength and power. If the core muscles don't have that all day endurance to keep the spine stable during every activity, well, then the obvious will happen. The spine will lose stability and become compromised. Therefore, when we select exercises to challenge the core, they must prioritize endurance over strength and power. Great, so let's recap. The core is designed for stability. Training for stability requires that the core muscles around the lumbar spine should be exercised isometrically. Because core stability is necessary in every movement and posture we assume, we must prioritize muscular endurance over strength in this area of the body. Great, so now that we have dispelled the myth that the sit-up is a good exercise for the core and we now know how the muscles around the spine should be trained, the only thing left to do is to find the right exercises. Well, after extensive research, I've put together a separate tutorial with the best substitutes for the sit-up that are not only better for performance and functional movement patterns, but also put minimal strain on your back. This tutorial includes a step-by-step -step guide on how to perform the movements. Remember, it's not just about finding the right exercises, it's also the way you execute the movements that will determine whether they are effective or not. To access this tutorial, you can follow the links down below to our Patreon page, where for just $3 a month, you'll gain access to this exclusive tutorial and all the others we have done in the past and will do in the future. We'll also be delving much deeper into the science of core training and lower back pain in the upcoming videos, so stay tuned for that. But until then, keep on exercising your health. Cheers.